In this lesson, we're going to continue our look at nucleophilic substitutions, focusing on the reactions of alcohols and ethers. Direct nucleophilic substitution on alcohols typically fails, and that's because hydroxide, the leaving group of an alcohol, is such a bad leaving group. We know that the equilibrium of a nucleophilic substitution will favor the side that displaces the better leaving group, and that means reactions with weaker nucleophiles like chloride or bromide will favor reactants largely to the exclusion of any products. Nucleophiles that are strong enough to displace the hydroxide and favor the formation of products at equilibrium suffer from a competing acid-base reaction. If we look at the top pathway of this reaction, we can see that it's a nucleophilic substitution, and equilibrium will favor product. Hydroxide is a better leaving group than the NH2-, and that means the products will be favored at equilibrium. If we look at the lower pathway, we can see the competing acid-base reaction. The NH2- is a strong base, and it can deprotonate that moderate acid of the alcohol. This reaction also favors product at equilibrium. In both cases, a negative charge is being transferred from a less electronegative nitrogen to a more electronegative oxygen. But the acid-base reaction is incredibly fast compared to the substitution, essentially prohibiting any substitution products from forming. Fortunately, alcohols can be coerced into nucleophilic substitutions under acidic conditions. Alcohols can react with the strong halogen acids to form alkyl halides. So in this example, we have ethanol reacting with HCl to form an alkyl halide and water. If we look at the reaction mechanism, we can see why this works. The first step is an acid-base reaction, in which the alcohol acts as a base and the HCl acts as an acid. Protonation of that oxygen forms an alkoxonium ion. The positive charge of the alkoxonium ion makes it considerably more electrophilic than the initial alcohol. More importantly, protonation of the alcohol has resulted in transforming the leaving group from hydroxide, a poor leaving group, into water, a much, much better leaving group. After the protonation step, the expected nucleophilic substitution occurs. In this example, because the leaving group is attached to a primary carbon, the reaction mechanism will be SN2. And so the nucleophile, chloride, attacks the carbon and displaces water as a leaving group. In this example, we see an SN2 mechanism occurring because we started with a primary alcohol. Had we started with a tertiary alcohol, the reaction would have proceeded through an SN1 mechanism, again preceded by that protonation step. The direct nucleophilic substitution of ethers also typically fails. A nucleophilic substitution of an ether would result in an alkoxide acting as the leaving group, and alkoxides are terrible leaving groups, just like hydroxide. Just like we saw with alcohols, ethers can be coerced into nucleophilic substitution under acidic conditions. The reaction is often referred to as ether cleavage. So in the first example, we have a symmetric ether reacting with HBr, and you can see that it forms an alkyl halide and an alcohol. The alcohol may or may not be isolated in the final product mix, and that's because, as we just saw, alcohols are reactive with the strong halogen acids. So in this case, the alcohol product could react further with HBr to form another molecule of bromoethane. One complication that arises with ethers compared to alcohols is that ethers have two electrophilic carbons. In this first example, the two electrophilic carbons, the two bonded to the oxygen, are identical by symmetry, and so it didn't matter which carbon was attacked by the nucleophile. In the next example, we have an asymmetrically substituted ether, where the oxygen is bonded to two different alkyl groups. And that means that two different possible sets of products could be formed, based on which carbon of the ether was acting as the electrophile. In this case, the oxygen is bonded to a tertiary carbon on the left and a methyl carbon on the right. And you can see that it was the tertiary carbon that acted as the electrophile creating a bond to the nucleophilic chloride and displacing methanol as a leaving group. If we look at the reaction mechanism, we can see why this is the case. Just as with alcohols, the first step is the protonation of the oxygen with the strong acid. The resulting alkoxonium ion now has two carbons that could serve as an electrophile. The carbon on the left is a tertiary carbon and would undergo a very fast SN1 reaction. The carbon on the right is a methyl carbon and would undergo a very fast SN2 reaction. And that means that this molecule is capable of undergoing a very fast SN1 reaction and a very fast SN2 reaction. It's just that in this case, the two reactions would actually be occurring on two different carbons. 
And when we have a reactant that can undergo both an SN1 and an SN2 reaction at roughly equal rates, we need to consider the nucleophile and the solvent to determine which mechanism will be dominant. So in this case, chloride is the nucleophile. And while chloride is negative, it's actually a very weak nucleophile. Chloride is the conjugate base of a very strong acid, hydrochloric acid. And if the acid is strong, the conjugate base must be weak. And weak bases are weak nucleophiles. And remember, weak nucleophiles tend to promote SN1 over SN2. The conditions are also highly protic. We have HCl, which is protic, and we could infer that the reaction solvent might be water. Water is a polar protic solvent, and polar protic solvents also tend to push SN1 faster than SN2. So in this case, the nucleophile and the solvent combine to make SN1 the dominant mechanism. The last nucleophilic substitution reactions we're going to explore are the reactions of epoxides. An epoxide is actually just a special ether. It's a three-atom cyclic ether. And we know that three-atom rings are actually really unstable. They have a tremendous amount of angle strain, and in this case, a considerable amount of torsional strain from the eclipsing CH bonds. The combination of angle strain and torsional strain found in epoxides makes them very susceptible to ring opening reactions. Any reaction that would result in breaking open that ring would relieve all of the angle strain and enable unlimited free rotation, relieving torsional strain. Now remember, epoxides are just a special class of ethers. And that means that epoxides will react with nucleophiles under acidic conditions, just like any other ether. So here we have an example of an epoxide reacting with HBr. Just as with any ether, an epoxide is going to have two potentially electrophilic carbons. In an epoxide, it's the two carbons in the ring. In this example, you can see that the two carbons are distinct. The carbon on the left has that methyl group attached, making it more highly substituted than the carbon on the right. A nucleophile, in this case bromide, could attack either of those two electrophilic carbons. The reaction of an epoxide with a nucleophile under acidic conditions is regioselective. The nucleophile prefers to attack the more highly substituted carbon of the ring. We can explain this regioselectivity by looking at the mechanism. Just as we saw with other ethers, the first step is a protonation of the oxygen with the strong acid. This results in a cyclic alkoxonium ion. Now remember, even though the formal positive charge is placed on oxygen, the actual electron deficiencies exist on the three atoms bonded to the oxygen. And that's because oxygen is more electronegative than either hydrogen or carbon. It turns out that most of the positive charge ends up on that more highly substituted carbon on the left. And that's simply because that's where that positive charge is going to be more stable. We can relate this to carbocation stability. We know that a more substituted carbocation is a more stable carbocation. And while this intermediate is not a carbocation, it still has two carbons with partial positive charge. And that partial positive charge will be more stable on the more highly substituted carbon, just as we saw for a carbocation. And because it's more stable on the more substituted carbon, more of that positive charge will develop on that carbon. Because the more highly substituted carbon has most of the positive charge, the electron-rich nucleophile would be more strongly attracted to it than the other less substituted carbon. So the nucleophilic attack occurs selectively on the carbon that is more highly substituted. In this case, bromide will attack the carbon on the left, which would exceed the octet on that carbon, so the carbon-oxygen bond is broken, pushing electrons towards the electronegative oxygen and breaking open that highly strained three-membered ring. What might be surprising is that epoxides can react with nucleophiles under non-acidic conditions. By opening the ring, the molecule is relieved of all that angle strain, which compensates for the poor leaving group. If we look at this example, we can see that we have the same epoxide we had previously. Both carbons of the ring could serve as a potential electrophile, and they are distinct from one another the carbon on the left being more highly substituted and the carbon on the right less substituted. In this example, methoxide will serve as the nucleophile, and you can see that there is no strong acid present in the reaction conditions. The ring opening reactions of epoxides with nucleophiles under non-acidic conditions are also regioselective, favoring nucleophilic attack on the less substituted carbon of the ring. And once again, that regioselectivity can be explained if we look at the mechanism. Because there's no strong acid, the epoxide oxygen does not get protonated in the first step. 
Instead, the nucleophile simply attacks the epoxide and breaks open the ring. Because the epoxide has not been protonated, there's not a significant amount of positive charge development in the actual molecule. So while both carbons of the ring are slightly positive because of their bond to that electronegative oxygen, neither carbon has really any appreciable amount of positive charge. And because there's no significant positive charge for it to be attracted to, the nucleophile prefers to attack the less sterically hindered carbon of the ring. There's simply less stuff to get in the way when the nucleophile attacks the less substituted carbon. Once the nucleophile attacks, the ring is opened, resulting in the formation of an alkoxide. The alkoxide is then protonated either by a solvent molecule, here methanol, or by an external acid added later.